Virtues. Ladies and gentlemen, Caroline Steele. Well, thank you for that welcome, David. Um, it was a year ago exactly when I was in this very same room with Vanessa and we met Christopher Monkton. We were talking about climate change. So, ladies and gentlemen, I'm the UKIP parliamentary candidate for Stroud and also chairman of the branch. I didn't even know what politics was all about two years ago. Now, going back in time, and is actually, coincidentally, in this room today, Somebody who knows me from 30 years ago, can you believe that? Because I've moved to a totally different part of the country. I was from Leeds, or rather Bradford originally. Yeah, and, uh, you know Bradford? And moved down to Wiltshire 20 years ago. So, when I left school, and I left school at 18, studied my A-levels and couldn't see the point in going to university, what was the point of getting a degree when I didn't know what I was going to do? So I ended up by working in financial services, dealing with life and pensions, working in an office, working my way up with day release, and became a manager. I handled lots and lots of life and pensions mis-selling. Uh, which happened in the 80s and 90s, and coincidentally a report has just come out a couple of days ago about that sorry saga in the industry. So I led a team of managers to recompense people, those who'd been wrongly sold policies, people like nurses and doctors, who'd come out of state schemes, their pension schemes, and took out individual policies that were never ever going to replicate their their effectively their company pension schemes. I saw a lot, of, well I was very disillusioned with the industry and when I moved down to Wiltshire after meeting my husband I qualified as a maths teacher so that's when I went to university in my 30s. So time moves on, family, and I became a financial education campaigner. If you google me Caroline Stevens, Wiltshire Financial Education Campaigner. I had a very privileged position. I would cover schools in Dorset, in, up to Gloucestershire and beyond. And I went into schools and encouraged teachers to put <coughs> financial matters into their lessons, which was easy for me because I was a teacher, so they did respect, because teachers don't like being told what to do, generally speaking, I have to say. And then I went into schools for a different charity and I talked to the, to the children and I encouraged them not to go into debt but to actually put a lot of emphasis into saving, which was a bit of a novel, um, a very novel topic really. I was really concerned that the kids, that our kids, were never going to be able to afford house prices as things were rising. It, it scared me. Now, finance is very much in my heart. I had the good chance of being asked by an MP who uh, was a part of an all-party parliamentary group on financial education to come and join his team. So I produced a report, all unpaid, it was all voluntary work. And at the same time, you may recall that Martin Lewis had an e-petition to get financial education into schools. So I got involved in that as well and wrote to people. I basically opened up my email address book and wrote to people night and day and then they went onto Facebook and told everybody about this petition to get a debate in Parliament because they have these e-petitions now on the computer. If you get 100,000 people, the chances are the government will debate your <laughs> issue. My local MP wanted to chat about my charity work. Another MP luckily got to see me in the classroom, uh, see me work with children, prepare a workshop and basically once we got the 100,000 signatures both those MPs went into Parliament for the debate and I'm now in Hansard which was you know for this girl in Wiltshire I thought it was quite amazing for, for this to happen. And finally in September of this year we've got financial education into schools. It was a result. I was in a position to influence other people. I'd been talking on the radio about budgeting on budget day last year with BBC Radio Wiltshire. 
And yet, at that time, I didn't realise I was just a week away from joining UKIP. So, I was formulating recommendations for the National Curriculum Review Team for schools because their teachers, they didn't know anything about finance, so I gave them examples of work to put into lessons for teachers. The same time I was doing that, I went to a public meeting for UKIP, signed up uh, to become a councillor candidate on the same night as I joined the party. And I was also doing public speaking on a voluntary basis on behalf of part of the actuarial commission, or actual, actuarial profession rather, um, I was their education spokesperson. So um, I was talking in the city and you know, had a thousand connections on LinkedIn, if anybody knows anything about LinkedIn. So I, I took 25% of the vote from a standing start as a, as a councillor candidate. I didn't even live in the area, but I went out canvassing every day in the four week window of opportunity. I was working alongside another councillor candidate in Melksham, which is where I'd hoped to stand. And he'd been an energy expert for 50 years. And he was telling me about the gross scandal about energy prices, renewable energy, and what a bit of a con a lot of it was. And with my finance hat on, I was thinking, well, with 40% of people by 2016 due to be in fuel poverty, I thought this is just not right. So we both supported each other while we were out canvassing. I learned a lot about uh, the energy industry. And uh, of course, you know, Christopher Monkton spoke here exactly a year ago to emphasize that there'd been no global warming in the past 18 years. So there was a lot of misinformation being put about, and I could see that the increase in energy prices was benefiting just a certain um, strata of society, shall I say. We became involved in the Wiltshire campaign launched by Winston Churchill's great-grandson, Jack, to prevent the spread of solar farms around the village of Seend. So I was on another campaign. Um, so we attended various meetings, including uh, one which had been arranged by a solar provider. The gentleman concerned was from Germany. So I quizzed him afterwards and said, look, I said, you're, you're wanting us to have solar farms, and yet in Germany, you're increasing your um, coal-fired power stations. How can that be right? He says, well, we've got a lot of coal in Germany. And I said, but we've got a lot of coal, actually, lying dormant in this country. So it's obviously one rule for one and one rule for another. Yeah. So learning, I've, I've just learned so much from those campaigns. And so I stand before you today as now the UK Parliamentary Candidate for Stroud and Chairman of the Branch, and also a mother of two children who are still at school. So my next campaign was about to arrive because of my networking. And in actual fact, David, in, in the answer to your question, I actually write to 750 people each day on my press matters. But uh, for anybody who's wondering why there's not been a press matters for the last three days, my computer has broken through, ex you know, it's exhausted, totally exhausted. So I'm out looking for a new computer. So next campaign about to arrive, through my networking, I met a gentleman called Torquil Dick Erickson. He's, he's not a legal beaver as such. He's not qualified, I, I believe, as a barrister but he knows so much about the European arrest warrant and I actually took the opportunity whilst he was over from Rome in the summer I visited him at his hotel and we talked about the government's plans about opting us back in to the European arrest warrant so I was on to my next campaign I like a campaign <laughs> So I included the European Arrest Warrant video at the beginning of all my public meetings. I always have it at the bottom of my emails, the links to the William Dartmouth and Gerald Batten video. And I even went to see my local Gloucestershire Police and Crime Commissioner to discuss the matter. He said to me, look, Caroline, he said, I'm, I'm just concerned about the safety of the Gloucestershire people. I said, but surely, this does concern the safety of the Gloucestershire people. If they go abroad, 
and they get taken away at dead of night and their, pet and their families can't intervene, nobody can intervene, surely those Gloucestershire residents should be of concern to you. Anyway, for me as a mum, the Asher King case, which I think most of us know about, with the five-year-old boy left in a hospital, a Spanish hospital, all on his own, didn't know anybody, everybody's speaking Spanish, his parents hauled to prison, and I think for most mums, I think that is just the straw that broke the camel's back, here was injustice in a big way. Nobody had said, nobody had been able to prove there'd been negligence. Those parents were just taken away and put into prison and, and their child was abandoned. <coughs> Truly shocking, a big scandal. Now with my, um, despite the fact that I, I talked to so many people, I think the general public still don't really know too much about the European arrest warrant. The government did have a debate of sorts a couple of weeks ago, and I know some of the UKIPers um, did stand outside the Houses of Parliament on the day it was due to be held. Unfortunately for me, I only got to know about it a couple of days beforehand, and it's quite difficult to get to London um, so, with such little notice, so that's the reason why I wasn't there. But yes, it was voted back in, the government have opted us back in, so when David Cameron stands there and says, that we are not going to give the EU any extra powers. That is a lie. Total fabrication. Now, with my campaigns, I don't lose um, contact with the people in those campaigns. I always keep my eye out. And in fact, Torquil wrote to me last night um, after asking me what the feedback had been like about the European arrest warrant video that I've been circulating continuously. And he's got a letter into the Daily Telegraph this week. And he commented that very recently, I think it was the 10th of December, a long list of worthy individuals and organizations signed a letter commemorating the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, talking about the ninth article, which actually says, no one shall be subjected to arbitrary arrest detention or exile, which is obviously flatly contradicted by the European arrest warrant, where people can be taken at the drop of a hat, no evidence, forget habeas corpus, and taken to another EU country. And those uh, people who signed includes, you might be interested to know, includes Age UK, Amnesty International, Fair Trials International, the TUC, and unison. So where do I go from here? Well there are now less than five months to go before the general election. My current campaign is to get elected. Not only then will I be able to influence other people but actually be able to do something about it. Those matters which I consider to be of particular importance and concern and about injustice. Once we've withdrawn from the EU, UKIP would be free to focus on, and these are areas that I consider particularly important, British jobs for British people. Mm. Is that so wrong to say that? I was, no. I was a bit sceptical about saying that. I want to see employers be responsible for training their staff again. Seeing their staff as an investment, which, to be fair, most of them don't actually these days. Because I've, I've been involved in adult education. <coughs> And I went to a, a seminar a few weeks ago, and how can it be right that only 50% of employers actually spend any money on training these days? And that 50%, a lot of that training is based on first aid, you know, mandatory courses, not to bring their staff up like I had the benefit of when I left school. So when they say, when, when employers say, oh, we can't get the staff here, we'll go abroad and we'll get somebody cheaper, you know it's the fact that actually the bottom line is that companies won't spend the money. Ensuring the sufficient affordable housing for British people, that's never going to happen when there's limited supply of housing stock and so much demand. I mean, how can it be right that Cameron states that he would delay housing for immigrants? 
to five years. And yet we've got homeless British people saying, well, what about us? Charity begins at home, surely. I'll be a strong advocate for cutting our international aid budget. We could withhold just seven hours worth of aid, just seven hours in one year, and the amount saved would fund all our food banks in one entire year. Charity begins at home. I want to see a fairer British society putting our children first and our grandchildren. They stand to lose out big time now if we don't get our act together. We've got to look at big picture and put our differences aside. Let's make this a country we're proud to live in again. Let's take back control. Thanks for listening. And then they went onto Facebook and told everybody about this petition to get a debate in Parliament. Because they have these e-petitions now on the computer. If you get 100,000 people, the chances are the government will debate your <laughs> issue. My local MP wanted to chat about my charity work. Another MP, luckily, got to see me in the classroom, uh, see me work with children, prepare a workshop, and... Basically, once we got the 100,000 signatures, both those MPs went into Parliament for the debate, and I'm now in Hansard, which was, you know, for this girl in Wiltshire, I thought it was quite amazing for, for this to happen. And finally, in September of this year, we've got financial education into schools. It was a result. I was in a position to influence other people. I'd be talking... I saw a lot of, well I was very disillusioned with the industry and when I moved down to Wiltshire after meeting my husband I qualified as a maths teacher so that's when I went to university in my 30s. So time moves on, family, and I became a financial education campaigner. If you google me, Caroline Stevens Wiltshire financial education campaigner, I had a very privileged position. I would cover schools in Dorset, in, up to Gloucestershire and beyond, and I went into schools and encouraged teachers to put <coughs> financial matters into their lessons, which was easy for me because I was a teacher, so they did respect, because teachers don't like being told what to do, generally speaking, I have to say. And then I went into schools for a different charity, and I talked to the, to the children, and I encouraged Ladies and gentlemen, Caroline. Well, thank you for that welcome, David. Um, it was a year ago exactly when I was in this very same room with Vanessa and we met Christopher Monkton. We were talking about climate change. So, ladies and gentlemen, I'm the UKIP parliamentary candidate for Stroud and also chairman of the branch. I didn't even know what politics was all about two years ago. Now, going back in time, and is actually, coincidentally, in this room today, somebody who knows me from 30 years ago. Can you believe that? Because I've moved to a totally different part of the country. I was from Leeds, or rather Bradford originally. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know Bradford? And moved down to Wiltshire. 20 years ago. So, when I left school, and I left school at 18, studied my A-levels and couldn't see the point in going to university, what was the point of getting a degree when I didn't know what I was going to do? So I ended up by working in financial services, dealing with life and pensions, working in an office, working my way up with day release, and became a manager. I handled lots and lots of life and pensions mis-selling. Uh, which happened in the 80s and 90s and coincidentally a report has just come out a couple of days ago about that sorry saga in the industry. So I led a team of managers to recompense people, those who'd been wrongly sold policies, people like nurses and doctors who'd come out of state schemes, their pension schemes, and took out individual policies that were never ever going to replicate their their effectively their company pension schemes to them not to go into debt but to actually put a lot of emphasis into saving which was a bit 
of a novel, um, very novel topic really. I was really concerned that the kids, that our kids, were never going to be able to afford house prices as things were rising. It, it scared me. Now, finance is very much in my heart. I had the good chance of being asked by an MP who uh, was a part of an all-party parliamentary group on financial education to come and join his team. So I produced a report, all unpaid, it's all voluntary work, and at the same time, you may recall that Martin Lewis had an e-petition to get financial education into schools. So I got involved in that as well and wrote to people. I basically opened up my email address book and wrote to people night and day